Hello and welcome to the Real Life History Podcast, a podcast where the four of us discuss history for a bit over an hour. Today's episode is about the British Empire and Industrial Revolution from the years 1837 to 1901. We shall begin with a short news segment of the things that have happened in the last two weeks. Cam, would you like to start it off? All right, so the first story is the Kazakh leader, so the leader of Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev, has resigned after being in power since even before the country got independent. I think he was the um, leader of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan as well. Um, so, yeah, three decades, and, like, yeah, I actually think that's pretty, that's pretty amazing, actually. It's kind of cool. So, basically, in a televised address, he said the decision was not easy, but he wanted to help the new leaders. He's 78 years old at the moment, and he has not been challenged, really, as leader. Hmm. I mean, mm. it says that he's essentially retiring. Well, I mean, he, he won't be, you know, full-on retiring. But he will no longer be the president, but people still expect him to be know, pull, calling the shots behind the scenes. Yeah, pulling the strings. He Some said sort. he would. He said he has decided to give up his powers as president. Mm. Mm. But can we Wasn't really some... take that to heart? Yeah, there, I mean, there was something recently in, in the Congo about Joseph Kaliba giving up his power, but he just made one of his cronies essentially the new president, and he'll be sitting around waiting, you know, or just enriching himself in that time. And I've a bit of a feeling we might see that here as well. Isn't that also the case of what Putin did for like a bit of a while with yeah, uh, yeah. his other member? Yeah. Yeah. So that's possible. Yeah, but the, the difference between Russia and Congo compared to this is that oh, I yeah. don't really see Nazarbayev coming back. He's just too old to be blunt. Mm. And if he's really giving it to a new generation of leaders, I think they're going to carry the torch. I mean, you say that, but he is just becoming the chairman of, of the Security Council. Yeah. I mean, is the economy going all right, or is, is the party falling apart? What's the reason that he's giving in, or is it just a personal choice that he wants? I think, um... Well, it, it, well said, the announcement... Well, what he says is he wants a new generation of leaders, so... And supposedly as, the, he's... as the article says, it comes weeks after the leader sacked the country's government, citing failures to improve the economy. Ah, oh, Okay. Yeah. So I think it's possible that he wants to turn it to a new like side. Mm. Yeah. Basically, on the other page. I wonder how this would affect Putin, because you know how like that guy was pretty close with Putin, and then oh, they had a very strong relationship. It'd be interesting to see how like the next president um relates to Putin and how like if Russian influence still uh, remains. Although I'm sure it probably will, but it'd be interesting to change that dynamic. There's mm. that Central Asian pact that the, all the stands have with Russia, so I don't really see them breaking the um, Commonwealth of Independent States, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's also Belarus, isn't it? Belarus is also. Yeah, I think Belarus is. But, I mean, they're effectively a satellite of the Russians anyway. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, all right. Um, the next article is the Brexit. We love hearing about that, don't we? Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> the Brexit day has been pushed back by at least two weeks up until, I think, what they wanted to say it was going back to the day before they had to... So the original up. set date was the 29th of March, and now this day is going to be about the 12th of April. Which is the day before that they have to field candidates for the EU election. Yes. Yeah. But there's a good infographic on the BBC article, and it essentially goes like this. So if Theresa May's deal gets, um, if, if her deal to extend this, uh, extend the date of withdrawal from the EU gets confirmed by Parliament, um, the EU will have, break, uh, will have Britain leave it on the 22nd of May. But if May's deal gets shut down now, um, another vote to extend it will be passed or will be put to Parliament on the 12th of April. If that's rejected, there's, I mean, nobody knows what will really happen. There'll probably be a no deal breaks. So if it were to pass, the MPs would now consider a bunch of alternative options, including cancelling Brexit altogether, uh, pushing for a further extension, or leaving the EU without any deal. And I mean, should should they push for a further extension by that point, they would have to stay in the European Parliament for much longer, and um, you know, second referendums will start coming in. So it's a bit of a convoluted 
this is essentially it's just buying more time for me to try to sort this issue out. It's not it's not gonna do much, like if you think about yeah, it. It isn't. They everything that the the British don't want stops every single chance they have. Like I forget what it was, but um how you find that. But there's there's always something blocking like a deal. They there's it's yeah. like impossible for Britain to achieve a a deal because they don't want to be in the economic zone and then they don't want to have what is it? they don't want to be have open borders with like they want to have open borders with Ireland but not not with the EU which conflicting doesn't make sense it's like it is just not going to work yeah. I'd be really interested in and, and May refuses to recalculate her deal even though it says here um, a, a petition that has just passed 3 million signatures has, has been occurring in London and she's still saying, um, you know, it would go against what the people voted for three years ago in, in a Brexit referendum if they were to cancel it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, my, my personal opinion is that they should do another referendum. Cause like, but then again, I can see why they don't want to do it. But, yeah. yeah. They've already had one referendum. The people said yes. So therefore, the government should do what the people want and not be like hesitant. That's true. That's true. Um, I guess, yeah, on the next story, which is um, Trump hails the fall of the Islamic State Caliphate in Syria. It's been, what, what, five years now since yep. they started, I think? Yeah, geez, it's been a long time. Ugh, yeah, I, the thing is, right, they may have lost their territory, but they're not They're not done. Like, they're not done. Um, I was reading it today. Is it? Some government organization or something thought they had like a couple, at least a couple thousand like um, SS members or like sleeper agents within the communities, um, just waiting for like the forces to settle, they to leave, and then the area to set, uh, settle down before they rise up again and form a new caliphate. Yeah, that, that happened in, in Afghanistan. The Taliban went yeah. into hiding. And then as soon as the Americans started wavering, they jumped back in and now controlled more of Afghanistan than they ever did. But there's not much you can do against that, is there? Because you can't say that. Mm. And then, like... It's interesting. And then this I'm... just gives Trump a justification to leave, because he's pulling out of the Middle East at the moment. Yeah. Just should be interesting to see how the effect that it's going to have on the Middle East. I don't know. Like... As much as I, oh, I always personally believe that the Americans should stop um, throwing their influence around so much, and I think they should take a backward step. And it's probably better for the Americans, the American themselves, that they're not doing this. We, the, the world needs someone like that to step in yeah. where there's human rights abuses and war and things like that to stop it. And like, exactly. yeah, I mean, the UN does it to an extent. But they don't have try to avoid fighting wherever possible whereas like the US is backing local forces and whatnot to actually fight them and stop them mm, but, you know. but I, I just have a feeling that despite the fact that ISIS doesn't actually have any you know quote sovereign territory anymore isn't going to stop all of their you know attacks and everything because essentially yeah, exactly. I mean the fact they don't have a base doesn't really matter the fact that they have people who are willing to you know, mm. launch attacks and things like that isn't going to be changed in any way. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, has anyone else got any news? I think that's it, right? I don't believe um, it. Well, I think we can move on to a pretty important factor news article, which is um, Thailand being now having oh, yeah. uh, an election now again after the 2000. So, as we know, in 2014, the all uh, Thai government was thrown out by the military as it was kind of seen as uh, using its power as well as trying to amend the 2007 constitution. So the elections are currently in place or happening now and about 50 million voters that head into the polls in Thailand. Mm. Yeah. It's so, the democracy in nations, so in 7 million people aged between 18 to 26 are eligible the vote for the first time and all parties have been keen to court the vote as well the current prime minister is in the vote which people are kind of seeing as unfair since he's been in power since 2014 after the military yeah. coup because he established it himself 
That's fair enough. What was it? The um, was it the king's sister? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The, the king's sister was nominated, but then got um as a present. Front yeah. Manager, but got thrown out because it was a conflict with Big Mom, which is interesting. I thought. Yeah. Like, hmm. But the the military still has a huge degree of control in Thailand, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it's, it's still technically a military government. Yeah. Mm. Because so, the the leader is a retired army officer that kind of organized the whole thing. He's a general, actually. Yeah. He, he's one of the I can't remember guys. exactly, but yeah, he was, he was a high ranking. Um, and there's also the factor of. Well, the main reason they wanted to overthrow the government originally was because of the, like, kind of the corruption that was possibly happening with the party and its uh, relationship to big Thai uh, organizations run by Chinese Thai, Chinese Thai family. I can't remember the exact name. Um, if I'm correct, it is... Oh, no, that's not it. <laughs> well, whilst, whilst Trent's checking that, I've just, you know, it wouldn't it be interesting if they did a little Bulgaria situation, I think it was, with... Oh, yeah, yeah. coming back and becoming elected and if they did like an actual simultaneous royal oh. prime minister and Here it king is. that would be the Shinawatra um, family it's a very very prominent uh, Thai Chinese family that owns a lot of organizations well, has been kind of a leading family in Thai politics and people are kind of starting to realize that it might have corruption or have like some form of rule the Thai government and they kind of want to get rid of it as fast as possible. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right. I think that, that covers all the news stories, isn't it? So we can probably move on to the, to the main topic of today, which is the, um, what is the British, the British the Empire, Empire and Industrial, Industrial Revolution. Revolution. Yeah. Will? All right. So the British Empire was one of the key players in in, in global affairs and, and still is to an extent to this day. And, and we'll just have a look at their military affairs, their internal affairs, just the whole lot essentially during the reign of Queen Victoria, which was from 1837 to 1901. And I know we're leaving the century a little bit by going into the 20th century, but that's negligible. And I think to understand the... Um, the British Empire's mindset and, and, and reasons for acting the way they did, we have to understand the Victorian mindset. And then the Victorian age was characterized by um, a sort of a viewpoint which advocated the reforming society, morals, and the state. And while there was clear racism against other races like Africans and Indians and, and Indigenous people in general, um, it was, I mean, Britain was one of the first con major countries to actually ban slavery. And most of this belief that Britain was the greatest nation on earth stemmed from their rapid expansion throughout the subcontinent and, and the rest of the world, essentially. And they saw themselves as a civilizing force in many of these places. And uh, the Victorian age also saw the restrengthening of religion in the face of scientific breakthroughs and essentially this streamlining and modernizing of Britain's political system, which I mean, essentially the role of the prime minister as we know it today was created during the Victorian age. So I think their culture has a big part to play in, in modern society today. Yeah. I mean, like, Indeed. They're, they're not to mention they were the biggest empire in, in, in the world and probably ever in the world, like, especially on today's world. It's a huge amount of influence like think about it well you can probably contribute all of america to britain as well to be honest. yeah because they were probably... yeah well i mean the culture is based off of britain almost yeah, exactly. uh, english-speaking nations are based off british culture definitely mm. i think i think yeah I, they, they did some pretty amazing stuff as well like nation as well as i think it's important uh, sorry, you, you might have well. cutting out a bit. Can you, say again? You, you cut out a bit there. Could you repeat that? Oh, um, I think it's important that people notice also the reforms inside of the nation, not just the land they conquered, and like how they actually contribute to those lands, like India, for example. Well, yeah, it's basically how they were able to help or basically improve 
uh, these areas and like make them more industrial and like more modernized compared to what they were if they weren't colonized. Yeah, I mean, I India, India, people... India yeah. as we can see, like, it's, it's a really refined place compared to before. Yeah, but I mean, we yeah. kind of have to take into account the British did some slightly horrific things in these places too oh yeah definitely definitely but that's with any empire like there's yeah, always going to be good and bad with any, even america there's good and bad with their spreading overseas like we discussed with the um ice Cafe. yeah and then something i found really interesting from like british internal society at this point was their politics and more like industrialists and self-made men were coming through the ranks so it was no longer just aristocrats dominating yeah. the whole thing and uh, I think it was in 1832 when they reformed Parliament and abolished all these rotten boroughs. And I, I mean, these, I mean, seats in Parliament were just ridiculous. I think there was this place in, in Surrey or something, and there were two voters, and they made it up for like one or two seats in Parliament. And people could just be so corrupt and dodgy using these systems to gain more power for themselves. And Britain was one of the first you know, democratic countries that actually really streamline the, the democratic process. Yeah. Uh, I, like, if you look at the effect of the, the British government on the amount, of, the amount of countries that have governments based off the British system, it's it's pretty pretty substantial. Like, the amount of countries that have a parliament. Yeah. yeah. They were the ones and, that and actually pioneered yeah. it. And most of the monarchies in Europe actually use more, much more of a British system than a um, presidential system, because obviously the monarch is the head of state. Yeah. And then the whole idea of the prime minister changed so hugely from you know pre eighteen thirty seven to post eighteen thirty seven, and I mean the main two in charge of this were Gladstone and Disraeli, and they were the ones that essentially created you know, the Conservative and, and to an extent Labour Party that we know today and, and their whole ideas relating to, you know, we should focus on the empire or if we should focus internally or should we care more for the, the rising industrial class or should we go back to, you know, the noble power of the realm. It still has a bit of relevance today, I think, with, with the um, – outlook of, of both the Conservative and Labour Party. So I think this was a really pivotal time in Britain's history and it, and it's still quite important today at least in our Brexit situation too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, apart from Britain's society and culture, something else that happened to it which was very important was the Industrial Revolution at this stage. And the Industrial Revolution kick-started the manufacturing boom more rapid than almost anything in human history, and Britain was the home of the revolution, so to speak. And many of the innovations were British in origin. And even in the mid-18th century, Britain was the world's leading economy. I mean, not China had the world's largest economy at this phase, but Britain was easily the most widespread and influential. And... Um, steam power and, and all these new inventions were used to you know, power trains or iron making was made a lot easier and it allowed people to construct stronger buildings out of metals rather than woods and all of these innovations and creations that the British came up with really gave them an edge over the rest of the world. I mean, I mean the Europeans were also quite into this stuff. I mean, all the colonized nations they tried to take over. It just gave them so much of an advantage when they could walk into places like India and just yeah. smash it up essentially without any resistance. I think yeah. England was uh, Great Britain was in a prime position because like that industrial revolution could have happened in in any other nation, but because they were at their peak and they were the global power at that time, it happened in Britain. And then like you know, the British mindset and things like that, I think. It is it is unquestionable the effect like the industrial revolution had on our world as well and the fact that like it was driven by the British yeah it's also unquestionable hmm. and and most of the landmarks around Britain today we can trace back to the industrial revolution like um, Big Ben essentially that was opened in in 1859 and and the belt itself was originally 
13.5 tons. It was two meters tall, three wide, and it took a team of 16 horses, 18 hours to pull the bell up to the roof or the top of, of the tower. And I just, these kinds of, you know, creations and, and buildings and, I mean, innovations were just colossal jumps in, in human life, essentially. Something as simple as a bell that really has such a hidden um, effect, you know, I mean, sorry, it yeah. reflects such a hidden effect behind it. It's just a bell, but in fact, it's the result of huge jumps in industrial innovation and societal innovations. Mm. Definitely. And the fact that life expectancy went up hugely during this time and more, um, infant mortality dropped quite a lot. I mean, essentially, the Industrial Revolution is like the foundation of modern life and modern society as we know it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you have anything to say. No, I don't really have anything to add to that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's not my right. it's not really my area of expertise. It's more of me just I, I thought like a, a technology in industry was was you quite literally, so to speak. <laughs> that doesn't mean I know much about the industrial revolution, is it? <laughs> sure. well, actually one thing I should mention about the industrial revolution is the effect it had on the environment. Oh. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's, that's the one thing that where there wasn't a positive. Yeah, imagine, imagine like, oh, actually, I should say like, all jokes aside, if you think about like the, the like the child labor and like the huge amounts of pollution being pumped into the atmosphere, like yeah. at insane rates that we've never seen oh, yeah. before, like industrial you know, factories that are that. pumping up pollution. Just I think minutes. because of the industrial revolution, it also led to a lot of like. Law, but um, worker like reforms and like laws around things like child labor. I'm pretty sure they. Mm -hmm. I mean, eventually, it, yeah. It, eventually, it, yeah. It but... Made people to realize, oh, this is actually pretty bad. Let's abolish this stuff. It, yeah. It, it led them to get to a greater height, and then eventually realize some mistakes that they could do not. Yeah. Yeah. Which is good because, like, if without that, we wouldn't have realized the problem. Maybe we would have tried today, possibly. Probably not, though. Yeah. Well, yeah, possibly not by this point. But it definitely possibly not, but eventually we might have had it later. Yeah. But I was saying, the Industrial Revolution allowed us to gain these new technologies that were able to help us produce even further and then innovate even more and more and more until we get to an extent, a more modernized point. It'd be interesting to see when, like, if there's another, like, huge jump, like, the Industrial Revolution, like, another one, like, from today onwards in the future, because, like, if you think about it, if you go all the way back, you had like the agriculture revolution, and then there was a couple of revolutions along the way that were huge really had... jumps in progress. Well, we and haven't really had any industrial like jumps. We've mostly had science jumps. Yeah, yeah. In, in scientific research, like areas in America and like Central Europe have had these big uh, increase in industrial like scientific research, such as nuclear nuclear research in America. I, wonder, I just wonder why, like. What would cause a thing like the Industrial Revolution happening, or something? I don't know if it's even possible to have something on the scale of the like, effect. Of the it, I, I wouldn't say like an, I wouldn't say an industrial. I would say like more a scientific. But like any, yeah, any sort of revolution has the same effect of the um, revolution. Yeah, yeah, if you quantify. Yeah, it, it will probably be scientific. Related. If you wonder, I don't think there would be another one that has affected that. Like, I don't know. But I mean, there's there's. Like been a huge computing jump from like the time the internet yeah. came out, and it, like life has been changed colossally since then. So yeah, you know, I mean, if that goes any further, I have a feeling that would have a huge impact. Well, I don't, but yeah, but the problem is it won't have a, like a big impact like the industrial revolution because the industrial revolution was something centered in basically one area, would be able to spread to other areas that weren't like propose this stuff well in today's society when one area like uh, it's not it's not one area that's gained this whole thing because like we have globalization yeah all exactly. areas will get all at once it's, it's 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 not gonna be like a massive revolution like where one country shares with the other it's gonna be one basically one whole group of areas will get it one at once yeah. and eventually share it or at least in quick succession of each other yeah or... because that's that's the factor of globalization yeah, that's, exactly. that's just some food for thought, honestly. Yeah, There's nothing in today's standard is created just by one nation. It's always it's based on multiple yeah. resources or mines created from multiple areas. Hmm. 
Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Back, back to the topic, yeah. <laughs> this is true. Right. Yeah. On so... to the uh, next little section that um, we've sort of set out. And it's it's the European affairs of the British Empire. And something to point out that's important in this stage, I think, is that after the Napoleonic Wars, Britain fought almost no major conflicts on the continent, and they had the so-called Pax Britannica throughout this time, yeah. where... It was essentially the British East, and it, it benefited their economy and everything hugely that allowed them to focus on their colonies. The, the, the major European involvement and engagement during um, Queen Victoria's reign was the Crimean War, and it was um, a break from Britain's decades-long run of almost complete peace on the continent, um, fought from between, uh, fought between 18... 53 and 1856, uh, the British and the Ottomans essentially took on the Russians with the British having minimal French support. And its primary concern was the so-called Eastern question, essentially Russia profiting off a really, really weak Ottoman Empire. And the British and French were keen to preserve the balance of power in Europe, so they, they intervened. And essentially nothing really happened territorially, and it only slightly delayed the the rotting of the Ottoman Empire, so to speak, after the peace was signed. Yeah. I mean, it, it was actually, I found it really interesting, the reason why it started officially. I mean, I know that this was just an excuse sort of for the French to go to war with the the, um, the Russian yeah. Russians in the first place. Mm. Essentially, Napoleon III said that he wanted to protect all of the Christians in the Ottoman Empire, and the Russians had already signed treaties with the Turks saying that even though they were orthodox, all the, ca- all the Christian subjects in the Ottoman Empire were under their control. And, um, obviously, yeah. yeah, and that created some dispute. I mean, Napoleon III really just wanted to do it for like, the prestige and to become friends with the Catholic Church again after the little French Revolution phase. Yeah. But, um, mm. the, the Turks just said, um, no, a friend, the French sent his ships, blasted up a few places in Constantinople, and the Turks said, yes. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it's kind of interesting, to be honest, um, that they used gunboat diplomacy in the Mediterranean and in Europe, not just in, in Asia, where they used mm. it in, in the yeah, open yeah. war. Mm. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, after... To scare Japan. <laughs> oh, yeah, the American. Open the gates. No. Bang. Okay. I mean, obviously, the, uh, back to the Crimean War, the, the Russians weren't exactly too impressed with this, so they launched a surprise attack and essentially smashed the Turkish fleet in the Black Sea. Um, Balkan campaigns happened, the Russians got driven back, the Caucasus campaign was kind of indecisive, so the British decided to land in the Crimea, and they sieged down Sebastopol, um, it was going well for them. The Russians weren't really as modernized as the British, thanks to the Industrial Revolution. But um, something. And Russia is backwards in general. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> we might go in the future after that. <laughs> I know it just went downhill from the It's not about the yeah. innovation. It's about how many men, you, how many men that you have that are more than that. The amount that the enemy has bullets. Good exactly. point. If you have more men than they have bullets, you're gonna win. <laughs> Insane. Uh, another, another thing that happened during the Crimean War, which wasn't exactly a great moment. Oh, we're talking about the No, no, no. Actually, okay. This is extremely. This is a very interesting thing we like to bring up. Is we have um, a surviving member of the Crimean War, Timothy the Tortoise. <laughs> no, the Tortoise. Timothy the Tortoise. <laughs> Timothy was a five kilogram Mediterranean spurs eyed tortoise. <laughs> Who was thought to be approximately 160 years old at the time of her death? May she rest in peace. Can I she just the... that they called it Timothy, but it, they didn't know it was actually a female. Um, yes. they, they didn't know how the sex the the at the time. Tree. So <laughs> the captain who found him, naming Timothy, uh, don't know because they tried. To, they tried to get Timothy to mate. <laughs> yeah. Timothy was not a male. Oh my god! <laughs> but yes. Timothy was 160 years old, which made her the oldest living UK resident, which is pretty interesting. Uh, 
It's not absurd. <laughs> Timothy was born in the Mediterranean Turkey and was found by a Portuguese privateer in 1854, uh, around when she was 10 years old, by Captain John Guy. I'm not going to... Yeah, John Guy, the Royal Navy. And it sort of served as a mascot until 1892. Uh, so, got to Timothy fought in a war by beating Timothy. And in 1926, Timothy Zone decided that he should mate, and it was discovered he was a female. How sadly Timothy um, left the Earth in 2004. Yes. But now the oldest living reptile is Jonathan. And he's Jonathan. Jonathan. The no way way to just like shit on the Crimean War with the turtle. I know, right? And then the best thing is there's a nice picture of Timothy. It's just, he has a little tag at Joe saying, My name is Timothy. Don't pick me up. <laughs> I'm very old. It's such a such a good. I love oh, the. I love like when just countries have like this one random animal for no reason. Like there's a, there's a few things like that, especially with the British. In Norway, the, Norway has a um, brigadier yeah. penguin. Nils Olaf. Uh, Nils Olaf the third. The third. Oh, yeah, 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 three yeah. Nils Olaf generals. That is. <laughs> Who currently anyway, was placed in, in prison. Okay, no, no, no more about Nils Olaf. Oh, yes. uh, now, may, may he live strong. To, to link Timothy back into this, Timothy was present at the bombardment of Sevastopol, and during that battle, the British had a little bit of a moment with the charge of the Light Brigade, which is one of their most infamous military yeah. blunders of all time. Oh. I mean, oh, the name <laughs> song. Oh my oh, god, please. Good, good bad. <laughs> it was so bad that the PM had to resign after that because it was just such an appalling miscommunication that um, at the end of the war, the British finally realized, oh, we need to stop selling commissions to aristocrats and actually professionalize the army. So that's why the British military machine was so effective after that little moment. Mm. Yeah. The British but, yeah. had an interesting military act because it was... That was like the complete opposite to Russia and China. It was purely quality over quantity. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then obviously, well, other than maybe that was a bit <laughs> that was a bit quantity. But um, the, the, but if you look <laughs> at their military <laughs> itself, if you look at their military itself, you see that they they put a lot of dedication into training their troops and like making them efficient. Oh and yeah. That's probably one of the main reasons why they're able. To... The, the army consisted of mainly just professional armies from the mainland itself, and also areas from uh, Germany, where they had like a lot of oh, yeah. kind of mercenary divisions that were actually really well trained and used in battle, especially from the area of Hanover, which they yeah, own. Mercenaries. Yeah. Hmm. And then obviously hmm. the navy was like a huge contributing factor to Yes, the, the thing is, Britain spent a lot of time in the navy. What was that? And I mean, they, what was they, um, I don't know the exact time. They have the policy where their navy is twice as big as the next. Pe- no, sorry, isn't it as, as as big as the bigger than the next two biggest navies in the world combined? Isn't it? That's their policy, or was their policy? Something along those lines. I mean, yeah. I know after after the Crimean War, like Britain had something crazy, like maybe three or four times as many capital ships as as the French did, who were the next biggest, and they just dominated. Um, our next topic is. Something that was a bit closer to home for the British, which was the Irish potato famine. Oh Not my god. The moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, after centuries of discontent in majority Catholic Ireland under Protestant British rule, the final straw that broke the camel's back came during the Great Famine, as the Irish called it. Um, Ireland was totally dependent on a potato. On a, to a degree that had never been seen anywhere else on Earth. And according to some estimates, the average Irishman consumed 16 pounds of potatoes a day. <laughs> Three meals of potatoes. <laughs> I, I know this is about a famine, but... <laughs> That's a lot of potatoes. Not potatoes, no! Potatoes. 16 pounds of potatoes, I mean. Uh, yes, indeed. That's a lot of potatoes. That's a lot of potatoes. The blight started in 1845 and lasted until 1849, and results included one million deaths from hunger, from the lack of potatoes, and a colossal depopulation of Ireland. <laughs> and the, fam- actually- the best thing about it is it's the potato famine, and in Ireland, the Great Famine. I know. 
a great family. Yeah, the population in Ireland is actually yet to recover from its yes. pre-1845 level, which is pretty tragic. But this was as a result, caused by potato blight. Yes. <laughs> but Irish culture has spread to many places around the world, uh, including, like, Boston, for one, and, and yeah. some... Even Australia, to an extent, with all the Irish convicts being sent there, I mean, it really expanded Irish culture around the world, despite the um, tragedy of not having enough potatoes at home. I just realised Ireland had three famines. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, How many? Well, have Ireland had three famines: the Irish famine in seventeen forty to seventeen forty-one. What was that a lack of? Uh, that was a yeah. lack of <laughs> yes. Was it like, you know, it, it was it was it was mainly due to weather, which uh, okay. screwed up crops. And then there was another famine in eighteen seventy nine, which was due to potato famine. <laughs> <laughs> potato famine and also cholera among chickens. Uh, that's um, not good. I know that the um, Irish got really stressed about this because the British still insisted on like robbing them of cash essentially and and exporting food from Ireland even though they did not have any food yeah. to feed themselves with so that was a pretty colossal problem the My king God. eats his food I know exactly alright All right. so Ow. with the colossal depopulation of Ireland where else would the convicts go or the the immigrants essentially the refugees from this crisis where would they go the colonies oh. so for colonial affairs um Modern there's quite Australia. A lot, actually, actually <laughs> there's quite a lot in this section primarily because the british focused a lot on this and we'll so, cover the right. opium wars um later on in this series but just to touch on them i think that would be quite quite fitting to be honest yeah, sure. yeah. i mean it's yeah. relevant to britain definitely in it is definitely relevant to UK, um, China, and obviously Hong Kong, and Weihai. I mean, Weihai. this is what happens when people offer you leaves and water. <laughs> <laughs> My god. So, to, to essentially recap for everyone, the, uh, the British entered the Opium War to protect their influence in the Far East and defend the nation's very heavy tea habit. Um, an estimate put about one-tenth of British national expenditure to tea. Oh my god. As such, the British are running a huge trade deficit with the Chinese and losing vast quantities of silver to them, and they came up with an idea to fix this. A massive state-sponsored and orchestrated drugs trade. Yeah. So, basically, you're saying here, if I just put some leaves in water, I'm an instant billionaire. Essentially. That is a good... <laughs> right there. Alright, I'm gonna start my own company. They essentially grew all the poppies in India and then turned them into opium and they just like covertly pumped it into China and the whole I'm country got hooked. Covertly. In Guys, I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna get some leaves from the backyard. Oh my god. <laughs> but yeah, China eventually became heavily dependent, or the Chinese people became heavily dependent on opium and as such, the British could just go in and take Hong Kong and, and essentially bash the Chinese economy into smithereens. And that, well, like, just the British as well was the most, like the Chinese economy was going to decline. Well. Everyone got up here to China. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mentioned the um, the lasting effect the Opium Wars had on China, and that we still see this very day the conflict between Hong Kong and China. Mm. That's the dominant mm. of Hong Kong, where it's Hong Kong to China, either rejoin Britain to a lesser extent or um, remain independent and have a more democratic system. Like that's causing a lot of strife but in China. Correct. I think in the in 2048, um, it's going to be officially annexed. Yeah, by, yeah, but uh, China's China. trying to fast track that process. The only reason they had that was because Hong Kong is a huge economic center, and so one of the conditions were that they maintain their autonomy because it would help them to remain this economic institution, right? Like yeah. China. But now you see Shanghai, Beijing, all those cities overtaking the like Shenzhen, and now like Hong Kong's realizing, oh, we can now we're basically over past seven hundred similar. Yeah, so the, mm. like same thing with Macau as well. Looking back, it's interesting that um, like it's such a lasting effect of the British Empire. You'd think it's a small piece of land has such a significant um, because of the British has had such a significant effect on China and like that like the power balance sort of in that region. Yeah. 
And, and one thing I would like to point out, can we just go back to the one-tenth national expenditure on tea? I mean, imagine, imagine that, like... That's pretty insane, like... That is... <laughs> just... How... <laughs> My god. How much tea do you have to drink for that? Because, like... Colossal amounts. My god. I mean, like, if, if I know this isn't, like, a direct correlation, let's just say that means every person spends a tenth of their income on tea. Like, y- y- ignore the house, ignore expenditures like food and schooling, but just tea. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, I'm surprised that they. If it, what happens if there was a tea famine? Maybe they'd have oh, to. Rest in peace, all of England, if there's a tea oh. famine. <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> the opium what will happen with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's over for the tea. <laughs> yeah, not not to get into the opium war because this I of a series. We might as well move on to the jewel in the crown. Yeah, so by 1805, slightly before our time frame, the British controlled the vast majority of the subcontinent through either direct governance or indirect vassalage after the East India Company. Um, went huge, so to speak. And throughout the first half of the 19th century, the British continued to erode away at the Maratha Confederacy and, and push further and further inland to absorb most of India's modern borders, and this was somewhat halted in 1857 by the Sepoy Mutiny. Um, the British brutally suppressed this, and it sort of failed because it wasn't a very coordinated attempt at, at breaking free of, of the empire, but by the end of it, the British essentially dominated the entire modern nation of India, so to speak. Mm. And yeah. after this, they got rid of the East India Company, the Honourable East India Company, as they called it, and it was ruled directly by the British Crown. And as a result, labour and, and resources were sucked out of India on a colossal scale, and numerous famines and a drop in the Indian economy were necessary in their mind to fuel British industrialization. So, just a bit of food for thought. Mm. The exploitation of India was like un. Like, yeah. Mm. But that's the thing about Europeans. They went colonizing with the sole purpose of stealing their resources, and India was like a prime example of this. Yeah. Similar to like the Dutch in the Dutch East Indies. Similar situation. Yeah. Like, very. And like, and I have to say, the, the Indians did show quite a decent amount of loyalty. Like, look at well. Mm hmm. <laughs> They were definitely... if you look at World War Two as well. Like the, they sent like a lot of people into the wars, and they World War One. Yeah, World War One and World War Two. World War One and World War Two. Many of the members of of colonies, especially. Yeah, sure, you can. Yeah. What were you saying, Sean? Ah. Uh, what were you saying? Oh, I said it. Fantastic. My God. What's up in the house? <laughs> yes. Most of the yeah, British uniforms are actually made in India. And, and to this just, day, or back then? No, no, no. Back then, yeah, during the Second World yeah, War. Yeah, yeah, I guess it doesn't make sense that would. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, but I can see that. Yeah, I can understand why that. The British. Oh, you would probably made in China. <laughs> <laughs> oh my uh, god! But then I, they wouldn't be that great quality. China's, oh, China's, China's fall, finally. What about China's finally recuperating after the Opium War by making British uniforms. I know to pay back for <laughs> oh, the. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. something to, to point out is the British actually completely destroyed the quality Indian textile industry and replaced like by the end of like by the time the British were done with them, India was actually a net importer of fabrics even though before the British um, arrived they were you know the greatest yeah the biggest in the world pretty makers on earth yeah and uh, with the silk production silk production yeah. especially well that's also in China but. Like... <laughs> yeah, but the um, big thing that happened during this time, as we mentioned earlier, was the Sepoy Mutiny, and I think it kind of shows an important um, bit of history. And, and they, how wait, they just, were they um, Muslims or were they Sepoys? Yeah, oh, they, I know they were soldiers, weren't they? Yeah, so Sepoys. essentially the, the Sepoys were Indian officer, uh, Indians under British control, and they were both Hindu and Muslim. And they got a oh, little okay. bit annoyed during um, this time because 
they their pay had stagnated and their treatment worsened underneath the British and they had been forced to fight abroad, which the British British had promised promised them they would not have to do. And a little like little things that, that the British did, like, you know, using pork fat to grease wheels, which really yeah. offended the Muslim subject. I, and do, using... I should say something. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever played Age of Empires, but the Indian campaign Whoa. is actually based around the Sepoy Rebellion. It's not oh, really? the, um, them throwing down their weapons because of the pig fat in the Enfield Rifles. It's actually yeah. pretty cool. I feel they... just, just putting in one of my favorite games. Anyway, continue. <laughs> Yeah, and then they also offended the Hindus by using beef in rations sometimes. And just in general, many traditional Indian practices were banned. There was this thing called the Sati, and it was essentially customary for a wife to throw herself on her husband's funeral pyre. Uh, the British banned polygamy and, and child marriage and slave labor. So, I mean, while it seems like, well, well most of them to the West at least are good changes, they were extremely yeah. innovative in India. Um, because it just essentially destroyed the caste system that they had used for hundreds, if not thousands yeah. of years. And on top yeah. of this, the fact that the Indians had no representation in Britain and the British could just hate what they wanted to, you know, really stress the people. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's quite a significant thing. Like, was that the first major, like, show of resistance against the, my right thing? The British in what India? Yeah, yeah, against It the was British. like the first main internal explosion that the British suffered yeah. in India. And it like, had such a that big effect on them for a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, India's I mean, kind of come about it these days, but there are people in India who feel stuff like, you know, the Kuwain or Diamond should be returned back to India, and it's part of the British That's crown jewels. Yeah. And I mean, it's just an interesting, I mean, it's obviously pretty bad how British just took everything from India, but to be fair, India has profited quite a bit out of it. I mean, of we've already discussed the major drawbacks, which I know a lot of people yeah. in India will take really seriously, but the fact that India is actually a country is, I mean, if we I mean, want to yeah. and everything, but yeah, before that, there were just, you know, numerous principalities and everything, and the British were actually the ones that made them a country. I mean, before you just have like Punjabi and a, a Bengali yeah. person within really? the center of India, but now it's yeah. like an Indian it's a identity. Area. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, to be well, fair, I should I should say the um the unification of India and the British also resulted in the Kashmir dispute. Yeah, which and is a downside the as well because they had they had the choice between joining all the states, joining a Hindu nation. India or a Muslim nation of Pakistan and then it was what was it? It was Kashmir and then like Hyderabad. But they got annexed straight away. Hyderabad was like they were the uh, Kashmir yeah. and Hyderabad were the only Hy- two nations. Hyderabad or you mean Hyderabad? Hyderabad. Yeah. Yeah, but those two nations. Actually I find that interesting that almost no one knows that Hyderabad was actually supposed to be independent. Um, yeah. imagine that though. Yeah, it was more like a list of so, times ten. Yeah, and the, but the Indians were like, no, so they invaded. <laughs> My God, I mean, I think on a slightly less serious note, the Indians are still quite pleased with the fact the British were there because if it wasn't for that, no cricket. I mean, I read very recently that. So they had this moment in India that somebody wanted to start a national soccer league, and then after like six months of investigation, I don't know why it took this long, but six months of investigation, they determined, oh, it's not going to be a good idea because ninety-three percent of all of India's like sporting investment goes into one sport, cricket. <laughs> oh my God, great but, stuff. Yeah, that's purely because of the British League. <laughs> exactly. If you look at all of the nations that play cricket, it's almost entirely British subjects or former yeah. British. Subjects. And Definitely. Britain. I mean, Australia, India, Pakistan, New Zealand, South Africa. Oh, Canada, actually. Canada yeah, doesn't Canada really play it a little bit, and it's actually quite popular cricket in, in the Netherlands for some reason. They actually play in the World Cup and everything like that occasionally, but yeah, it's almost universally British subjects. Yeah. Or former yeah. British subjects. And speaking of British subjects, 
the next important thing that the British did was essentially laying the foundations for the Commonwealth. So the British expanded into extremely large areas of land with less concrete and centralized powers like Canada and Australia and New Zealand. And in these places, um, they, well, actually, I was reading this book recently called um, After Tamerlane, and it's about the rise and fall of global empires. And I yeah. it's called that because Tamerlane was the last, you know, conqueror who conquered all of his known world. Whereas everyone who came after that wasn't actually able to conquer the whole globe. But yeah. it was, it, it had this like theory that um, places like Canada and Australia and New Zealand and America as well, a near Europe in the sense that the vast majority of the population is white and their yeah. system of governing is you know westernized even though they're in a land that is originally controlled by people who are completely different from them. I thought that was a really interesting idea that the book put forth. Yeah, that, I mean, well, that, that pretty much is because like Australia, all of those places are made up of most Europeans. Well, at least in Australia, you see the um, acknowledgement of um, the Aboriginals and the fact they were here first. And there's a lot of yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's to, you know, it's always a touchy subject. I don't really want to get into it, but like, it is definitely in you know, Europe, and that's why you see the tension between the Aboriginals and the white settlers. Because we literally just came in here and imposed our ways on the indigenous people and just yeah. it our homes. I was the same with America. That's true. Yeah, yeah exactly. You saw hmm. a lot of a lot of stuff happening with the Native Americans. Uh, hmm. so, uh, yeah. I mean. Another thing that's kind of interesting is how, I mean, interesting but kind of tragic is how they essentially just obliterated the natives and somehow just New through Zealand the actually is a perfect example of that with them literally giving guns to the Maori and then them killing themselves in order yeah. to trade with the British. Tragic, but. Mm. I mean, this, the actions of setting up colonial governments in these places is essentially the reason why, like a country like Australia, which is so far away from Europe, is somehow like predominantly white in this entire, yeah. you know, Asian continent, Asian region, all that. It's, it's kind of interesting how that's the reason why it's like this lone westernized country in this whole mass of, you know, Eastern yeah. countries, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, essentially, just to list through everything that the uh, British did to, to solidify these colonies, they confederated Canada in 1867, um, they federated Australia in 1901, um, essentially they, after the Boer Wars, solidified South Africa, and, and in New Zealand they essentially were also confederated into a country, but they were their own colony to begin with. So, Honestly, it's kind of interesting that the British are pouring so much resources into their colonies and strength, strengthening them in, you know, the hope or expectation that one day they would flood everything back to the mother country, so to speak, and, you know, enrich yeah. the British. I mean, like, even though you, you can take a one-sided view of the, the British came in, they exploited everyone and they made themselves, but in reality... In doing so, they also introduced these better ways of life. Like they introduced like advanced, like a lot um, better like legal systems and systems of government that we use today, which we seen, which we consider democratic, and we consider all of that, you know, beneficial to society and running society. So, yes, they did exploit these nations, but the, there is a, such a huge benefit that, like, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard for like yeah. when I if, if ever someone has a one one sided view of it. It's always like annoying because, you know it, it the British gave gave and they took, essentially. Mm. And I think at the end of the day they realised that with these countries having so much more influence and, and power they just had to eventually give them the right to home rule and yeah. that's the reason why countries like Canada and Australia and, and South Africa and New Zealand and even India to a certain extent are like you know independent countries yeah. and how I mean I know India and South Africa and stuff have left the Commonwealth but the fact that effectively the British system has stayed intact in places like Australia for you know 
so many. I mean, what did discover straight like 17, 70 or something like that? Well, well, someone before him discovered it, wasn't it? Dutch guy. I mean, yeah, but mm, yeah. I mean, when, when did when did Arthur Philip land? Anyway, um, I think he landed somewhere around that time when the British actually started settling it, and yeah, yeah. Was really mm, still so somewhat intact from that, you know, moment. It's pretty impressive, like that we saw the Queen as the head of state. I know that's a touchy subject in Australia, but you know, the continuity of being a British subject for so long is kind of interesting, to be honest. It's a nice piece of history, like. You know, I, I, I've always said that I, I personally think Australia should remain a Commonwealth just because, like, the this, this system of government would be exactly the same, except there'd be no Queen at the time. And then that, if we became a Republic, and then becoming a Republic would remove centuries of heritage that we have. And it's like, it's a part of our history having a Queen. Like, you know. Yeah. All right. Um, on to the penultimate topic. Which is another thing that we're only going to go over briefly. We're going to eventually do it later on in this series. Um, the Berlin Conference and the Scramble for Africa. So many people saw the Berlin Conference as like a formalization of the Europeans running into Africa and, and grabbing land essentially. And it was held by the big Otto von Bismarck in 1884 to 85. And as a result, there was this huge interest in Africa from the Europeans, and eventually it led to, effectively, the near-complete subjugation of the continent. I think only by, like, just at the outbreak of World War One, Liberia and Abyssinia were the only independent nations, and the rest were essentially just cut yeah. off British. Well, even Liberia was basically a colony of the Americans, mm. but they weren't they didn't before they were their slaves back there. Yeah, exactly. They were like, you're free now, but you're not allowed to say you're getting shipped back, which is horrible oh. yeah that's essentially what happened like yeah so basically ethiopia abyssinia was the only independent nation i mean yes liberia was but they were still affected by colonial influence and set up by a colonial power so yeah i just think it's interesting how how little concern or thought the europeans put into hacking up the economy i mean like i forgot what it was but i think it's the reason that Namibia has that panhandle. Yeah, yeah, because the guy wanted the lake, the one on an island. Yeah, like some, some guy essentially just wanted his own, you know, hunting reserve, and then they asked this random Italian prince to just draw a border, and he said, "I've got this guy," and then that was the border. And like, so dumb. A hundred and thirty years later, we're smacking our heads against the wall because like there's no consideration for ethnic boundaries. Look at um, look at Republic of Congo. It's got like these massive weird borders going to the north yeah. and the south and then the tiny tiny bit of ocean so weird. I mean, I think with the, I mean we'll touch on it next week um, next episode but like, and probably the week as well the king of Belgium can own all of that as his personal stuff yeah I know it's like it's, I mean actually the, the Belgian Congo I know it's not even it's not even related to Britain but like Oh my god, the atrocities committed in that corporate state. It was yeah. the hands. horrific. Yeah, exactly. Hands were basically. Hands were used as a currency at the point. It's like, what the hell? I mean, exactly. so, what, so what was like. I know that was hosted by Bismarck, but the, I assume the British had a significant. I don't know too much about yeah. it. The British had a significant I mean, amount of influence. From what I've really read is that essentially it was British. I mean, the British were allowed to attempt. The Germans stopped it, but they tried to go from Cape to Cairo, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, obviously. The, and yeah. they just get from that massive land bridge across. And they achieved it after World War One, but yeah. Mm. Yeah. But I mean, I think it was just, um, I mean, obviously, it'll be, we'll, we'll go into depth later on, but um, just interesting to point out that Africa was like the last unknown frontier and that the British even though it was like 300 years after that initial colonizing explosion, it was still just as into yeah. empire as they were back then. Mm. All okay. right, and the final topic is actually one of the le- you know one of the less least known, but one of the most interesting, I would say, and it's the Great Game. And yeah. essentially, it began in the Napoleonic Wars. There were struggles of the common zone of interest in Central Asia and Afghanistan between the British and the Russians. Yeah. And the British were a bit scared that the Russians would threaten the jewel of the crown. 
and the Russians were a bit nervous that the British would go into Central Asia and take their land, essentially. So while the two sides never really came into conflict, um, the diplomatic outmaneuvering and, and the little Asians of small countries um, kind of interesting in this thing, actually. That's just like, it always amazes me how much influence that the nation of Afghanistan has on the world. Like, you'd expect it to be like Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Afghanistan, like all those nations that genuinely have an insignificant amount like, of impact on the world. And then Afghanistan just has a huge amount. Like, mm -hmm. it's called the Graveyard of Empires. Like, I mean, that's a pretty cool name, but. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Mm. Like it was so desperately fought over in this. Why it's just just desert and mountains, <laughs> but yeah. I guess that's like sort of similar to the scramble of Africa. These nations just wanting land, even if it's just jungle or desert or. Well, it's not about what basically. it has. It's about asserting dominance in comparison to other nations. It's just showing off the I'm power. Bigger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm I'm bigger than you. Thus, I will bully you and be stronger. <laughs> <laughs> to paraphrase. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the Great Games are actually pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. Um, with with uh, Afghanistan, what I thought was kind of interesting is how, um, as soon as the British had like this fear that somebody was going to touch, like touch or get their hands on um, India, they immediately went into panic mode. And yeah. like, even though there was like a small little leak of information that during the Napoleonic Wars, the Russians were considering going into India. To Central Asia, the British just flipped into like emergency mode and just started like you know upgrading plates, sending more troops there, you know, deterring the Russians. Well, that shows just illegal. how much like, India mattered to yeah. like, the people, the resources, like that. It was just such a huge contributor to Britain and its empire. Like without India, Britain would have been immensely would have had immensely less. In I mean, it's still been influential, but like. And it just yeah. shows how much they actually, like you Massive. see through like things like we were talking about before the Sepoy Rebellion, things like that. It seems like they don't care too much about the people, but in reality, they they really desperately want to hold on to it. Mm. it has such a mm. yes, and it's quite interesting that the fact that Afghanistan's borders today are still determined by the Great Game, and how you know the British and Russians never wanted to actually border one another, so they just changed Afghanistan's borders so that it worked for them. And it's literally like a single line. Yeah, in into China. Mm. Mm. And then and, um, with the Great Game, actually, it was like, with um, Afghanistan, at least, it, it's interesting that you brought it up earlier, Cam, about the, you know, the graveyard of empire. Yeah. The British went in there the first time and just got decimated. Yeah. And the second time, suffered huge casualties and somehow managed to win. But, like, the cost of actually trying to get there, you know, into that mountainous desert, high altitude, you know, desolate place. It's That's just... the perfect example of, um, what is it, home, ter um, home front advantage? Yeah. Where Afghanistan, the people there, knew their territory so well, uh, hence why they're so good at being guerrilla warfare there today. It's like, they just know their land so well, and it's such a foreign and harsh territory that any invading force just has the worst time of it like exactly. I, I don't i can't really think of any other place on earth that's had such a significant like i mean so that is as hard to uh, to as many people conquer, like jeez um i'm gonna mm -hmm. raise a strong flag for russia in winter <laughs> yeah i guess that's fair <clears throat> russian winter yeah but i mean like but even so countries yeah. such as russia could even invade afghanistan that is true yeah yeah but it's obvious it's, it was too hot there for them. They need the Russian winter. Then they could do it. <laughs> my, well, there are just God. too many damn hills. <laughs> yeah. Actually, something interesting about the Great Game and, and the Second Anglo-Afghan War when the British actually finally took Afghanistan. Um, it's like, I, was, I was reading some Sherlock Holmes recently, actually, and Dr. Watson, Holmes' um, yeah. acquaintance, so to speak, yeah, was actually the reason why he, you know, walks around the way he does and, and um, has the injuries he does is because he was supposedly a veteran of the second, you know, Anglo-Afghan war. And it's interesting that an event like that can seep into, you know, popular culture, so to speak. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good book. Sherlock Holmes is definitely a book recommendation. The only reason I wouldn't do that is simply because, the, honestly, films, books have all been so immensely oversaturated with Sherlock Holmes and, like, run off to so many shows and... Like, no, no, I mean, like, the original. Yeah, yeah, I know, but, like, even then, it's hard to read that book when I've been exposed to so many... Guys, I think this conversation other, has reached its pointlessness. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. You know. All right. And the hungry, hungry caterpillar. <laughs> you know, actually, I, re- I really recommend um, Kevin by Rob Biddle, too. Ah, uh, yes. That's a terrific read. The Gruffalo? Did you guys read the Gruffalo? Oh my god, I, I read that one. The Gruffalo was a lot of stuff. The Gruffalo was amazing. I don't know why that just jumped in my head, but it's it good stuff. I like anyway. how this is what we go from the British Empire to. <laughs> the you Gruffalo. guys love the Hungry Hungry Caterpillar? I know I do. <laughs> my favorite part is when he becomes really fat and then starts to go into his cocoon. That, that's a very thick boy. <laughs> yes, that is my favorite part. And my goodness, I should write an essay on it. Oh, yeah. how, sure. how it inspired me. Maybe I should. Because my English at the moment is going to get age Oh. <laughs> Just how I was inspired by the Hungry Hungry Caterpillar. Alright, we must thank you all for listening. The conversation. Yeah, I think that's about it for today. Um, ah. Alright, so that's the end of the episode on the British Empire and the Industrial Revolution. Thanks for listening. Goodbye, good night, good day. Good yes. That's about it. It's IGN. Adios.